You know, I, I didn't think that I would ever take something from a country music concert and use it in a sermon. Well, I knew I would use parts of it, but I didn't think I'd take this. But well, I got the chance to go to the Chris Stapleton concert in Rapid City uh, this past week, and it was epic. Yes, I said that. Yep, it was great. He sounds better live than his on Spotify. But he said something that was really cool. And he said, You guys could have been anywhere in the world and spent your money on anything, but tonight you chose to be here with our band. And, uh, and I was like, Well, I spent my mom's money, not mine, but, you know, whatever. So, uh, you didn't pay to be here, but you could have been anywhere in the world today. But you, you came to come and exalt or explore Jesus. And I'm really glad that you came to do that here at Gotham Church. <coughs> glad that you're here. I, I want to start off by talking about Texas Fence Post versus Wyoming Fence Posts. And that will launch us into Acts chapter 6. So if, you're, if you want to be ready, we're, we're going to take off from Acts chapter 6 verse 1. It'll be a short flight. In verses, not in time, but Acts 1 through 6. But as we prepare to hear the word of the Lord in Acts 6, let me tell you a story. In Texas, we always had, I mean, there's a lot of fences. It's a lot of private land. I know that any of you who are born and raised in Wyoming don't understand what that is like. Uh, but in Texas, there's lots of fences. My dad oftentimes would tell me, go fix the fence in the backyard. The fence had been there for like 25 years. There's no fix. 25 year old fence, okay? But what I noticed, and, and as we were trying to fix these fences, is that the posts were only about 12 inches in the ground, one foot. The only really had to have a foundation of, or of, the, of the 4 by 4 post only had to go about 12 inches in. Now, if you were wise, you'd go a little deeper. But I don't think Texas even had a regulation on how well it must go. So I go to build a wind wall, which is also something that Texans don't know about. So uh, uh, we lived in the trailer park right out past the Loaf and Jug for a few years, for two and a half years when we got here, and the wind always blew from one direction, what was always chilly on my porch. And so first world problems, I wanted to build a wall to, uh, to protect that. Um, and so I, I built this, or I wanted to build this wind wall. And then, this is where I get the Republican in me came out, or like, I don't know if I'm saying Republican, I mean, I am, but just the red-blooded, staunch American came out, because they're like, well, you got to call before you dig. I'm like, a oh, mile on property? I was so mad. I had to call someone. They're like, do you want to blow up or not? I'm like, I don't know And then they're like, I'm going to check the regulations of how deep, and I'm like, I'm not an idiot. I'm going to dig in the dirt. And they're like, it's got to be four feet deep. Why only regulations? I was like, good. Night living. I guess I was going to be an idiot. <laughs> so, uh, so now in, uh, where is he at? Where's Gage at? I see him right there. Yeah. Uh, I, it's just popped up in my memories. That Gage, me, and little baby Ava were digging, dig with post hole diggers. Dig. I think Ava did better than Gage. But, anyways, and so we were digging these absolutely massive holes because I realized. That whenever the wind gets up to about 40 to 60 mile an hour gust in Texas, insurance companies are getting phone calls off the, or just like crazy because everyone's fences have broken and fallen down. Whereas in Wyoming, 40 is a breeze. Like 40 is an answer to prayer for a calm day. And so 80 mile an hour winds regularly hit the fences in Wyoming and it does nothing because structure is dug so deep because it has a strong foundation. And as I thought about that memory that popped up on my phone of digging hours of coastal, maybe you're stronger than Gage and I, but it took us a long time to dig. And I don't know if all of them got to four feet, but they're close. Um, as I thought about Texas fence posts versus Wyoming fence posts, maybe realize that in, in Acts chapter 6, we got some fence posts going on. And, and the overall goal of what we're going to see today is that the healthy church structure is essential to kingdom growth. Healthy church structure is essential to kingdom growth. I'm going to read the whole passage, then we're going to go back and work through verses 1 and 2 and so on through. Okay, read with me. In those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, 
There arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the whole company of the disciples and said, It would not be right for us to give up, or the word neglect, it would not be right for us to give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole company. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a convert to Antioch. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And so the word of God spread. The disciples of Jerusalem increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. So the first thing that we, we're going to see that come out of these first two verses is that practical needs increase as numbers increase. Practical needs increase as numbers increase. There used to be a time where there was very few practical needs in the life of Alpha and Church not too many years ago. In October of 2019, when Alpha and Church was birthed, very few practical needs, very few people. And then all you jokers show up. And now there's needs. And there's, there's, uh, there's all kinds of things in the attention. And I'm praising God for that. But it, I, I want us to see something that is going to kind of help set the tone for the whole passage. It is, it is, I'm going to test you on some Bible reading particulars. If you see a therefore, you want to ask what it's? There you go, look at that. Okay, I'm going to test you for my sermon. Um, finish the sentence for me. The Sadducees were a group of people, a group of Jewish leaders who didn't believe in the resurrection, and that's why they were so sad. Ha <laughs> ha! I've uh, preached Mike Haley so much ever since I said, see, that's why they're so sad, you see. Oh man, I'm going to call him and tell him that. Great job, church. Okay, Bible tip number two here. Okay, when you say therefore, you ask what's therefore. Now, this one's a fun word called inclusio. You could just say inclusion, but inclusio sounds more fun. When a passage starts and ends in the same way, is this what you call a biblical sandwich? And so, whatever takes place in the middle is important as to how the, the, the beginning and end took place. And so, here we see it begins, as the disciples were increasing in number, and the very end it says, the disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number. And so, the, the, if you're a good Bible reader, the question you want to ask yourself is, what happened in this sandwich, or if you're from the South, sandwich, what happened in this Bible sandwich that I need to be paying attention to? And the first thing that we need to be paying attention to is that as practical needs increase as numbers increase. And so the church here in Jerusalem was experiencing increase. That's a great thing. But it happened quick. And a complaint arose. A complaint arose by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews. And those are just two different ethnicities. Some either grew up speaking Hebrew and could speak Greek. Some only spoke Greek. And so we've got some ethnic divides. Now we also have a gender divide going on in the early church. Yeah, 2024, gender wasn't always just an issue. Or it didn't just become a problem, right? A hot topic. It has always been. And so we have an ethnic divide and a gender divide in the early church. And so they increased in numbers. What's great is that this church, not just a few months prior to this, a few months prior to this, the church was 120 people. That seems huge to me, right? That's a mega church in Barna, Wyoming. And so they were 120. The resurrection happens. One sermon in, I mean, this our first church gathering was epic. It was not the Acts chapter 2 epic. Peter preached, there's a whole bunch of people there, 10,000 gets saved. That's, it's, or I think 5,000, so it's 5,000 gets saved. Absolutely incredible. A lot of them were baptized and joined the church that day. That's also incredible. But that's 
going to be a problem. <laughs> because as practical, because practical needs increase, as numbers increase, now they've got a bunch of widows. Perhaps there was a widow in the church when they just had 120. But in this day, this economy, women didn't really have a means to make money. Now there was opportunities and things of that sort, but primarily the way the culture operated is the, the father, the patriarch, would care for his wife and then any of his children. As they married off, then the husband would take care of that wife. And then and the children and things, so you can kind of see this, but it always had to do with the men providing. Okay? If a husband died, then this is the oldest son took care. And then the other son, and there was all kinds of rules. But every now and then you wouldn't have any other sons or anyone to take care of. And in this culture, to be widowed with no one to take care of you is a guaranteed destitute life of poverty. Almost. And so this is beautiful. The early church, this, was a, this is an ancient practice that the Jews did for thousands of years. And it is a practice that immediately the new church, the early church, takes on. And so these widows who didn't have a means of income or, or provision, they would come daily to the church. Not to the food bank of the Rockies, but to the church. I'm praising God that we do have a food bank of the Rockies, but we didn't know there was no other food bank. It was this. And so they would feed the widows every single day. And so as, as the numbers grew, the amount of widows grew as well. And so now we have this huge daily ministry of widows that are needing to get food. Now, I did some numbers here. Which is a very dangerous thing. <clears throat> but prior to resurrection, the apostles, or the, the, the 12 disciples, had 120 people. Post-resurrection, there for a couple weeks, they had 120 people. So the pastor to member ratio was 1 to 12. That's exhilarating for us. 1 to 12. 120 to 12 disciples. Okay. Now, if you just did the low estimates that the church now has 5,000 members, now the possible estimates are 10 to 15,000. But if you went below, now the pastor to member ratio is 1 to 416. Talk about pastoral care going down the drain, right? A whole bunch of people feeling like preacher don't love me no more. And so here we have the problem the pastoral care ratio went from 1 to 12 to 1 to 416. And that's if you do the low conservative numbers. And this brought on a problem. It brought on a problem that brought two problems. The problem that we first see is that well, the owner of the uh, tan Jeep Grand Chipper uh, everyone put your keys out. And, uh, <laughs> this is actually part of the sermon. And now we want you to be generous and not No. Everyone hit your car alarm. Uh-oh. I actually saw that a few of you were falling asleep, and so I, I made a motion in my eyes, and I was not praying to wake up. And so, welcome back here uh, into a riveting moment of Acts chapter 6, and we're realizing that a problem creates two problems, and so... And the first problem is that these widows are coming. And the Greek widows might not be getting as much food as the Hebrew widows. So we have an issue here. That's a problem. Well, that problem presents a second problem because the apostles are now aware of this. And they're going, oh, dang it. There was a time when there was only like 20 of those people that we could do this ourselves. But now it's so big. It's a daily ministry. They're not getting what they need, and we can't fix it. And so the, the second problem, which is the, actually the bigger problem, is the pastors are now saying, it would not be right for us to do this ourselves. For in doing this daily needs ministry, it's vitally important. We would actually be neglecting the other daily needs ministry that's vitally important of the word and and so now a problem creates two problems. And so the apostles are thinking, we've got to get this thing going because these women are unbelievably important to our lives, the life of the church, and to, our, to God. And so we've got to care for these widows, but we can't do it. What is it that we are going to do? Now we're going to get into that 
in just a moment, the first thing that we want to see, again, is that practical needs increase as numbers increase. As the numbers increase, the widows increase, the need to feed them increase, and they got beyond what this group of 12 can do. I didn't ask my wife if I could do this, but she's been married to me for nine years. She, she trusts me, and I trust her. The Martin family had a system upgrade in our home this month. For nine years, ladies, if you sit by a lady, don't let them pull the gun out in the next few seconds, okay? For nine years, I've been right about certain things in our home, okay? Now, I typically am not helping too much with the solution of those. I just, I was born to be a supervisor. If there's a problem, fix it, right? And so this is a problem in our marriage. And, and what has happened is that, and this is all in the but over the last nine years, uh, we had a system when we were newly married with no kids that worked. Our house was full of this awesome apartment. It was beautiful. Loved it. Then we were broke. I lived with my parents for three months, and uh, that was that was awesome. I love my family. I was miserable. Uh, and then and then we we moved uh, into a parsonage which provided for us. And we had a whole boy. Then we had a kid. Then we had a second kid. And then we had a third kid. Um, and what what we realized this past month is that that system never upgraded. And so everything's still relying on Ashley in our home. Again, ladies, don't shoot an eye or hint, okay? That's all. But uh, laundry, food, dishes, cleaning, organization, all of that, Ashley. And so we, we were kind of just sitting down and I said, hey, listen, I, I'm not helping one, I'm not helping two. And uh, all the wives said, amen. And uh, I said, I'm not helping, but here's the deal. Even if I help, this is a broken system. And so the, the favorite words that my wife's ever heard is, we've allocated money to a household budget for you. And so uh, we, we, we set aside some money, and we said, buy some upgrades. And now, if you come to our house, it's incredible. Like, the, the dresser for the kids, the, everything's like cheap on Amazon, by the way. Don't judge me. Of course, if I want to spend money, I guess we could have. But... Um, and so we, we upgraded. There's a hamper. There's a hamper in our bathroom now, guys. I thought the system was throwing my clothes on this morning bathroom. 100% thought that was my job. My wife said, why do you always do I'm like, I don't know, there's no hamper. Nope. I just thought this is what you wanted from me. Now listen, don't tell me. There was some miscommunication going on, okay? Not all of you. <laughs> so now we got a hamper. And I know where my clothes go. Amen. And then I'm just like, this is incredible. My mom was like, praise God. Finally became the man I tried to make you. And, and so, but we had a system upgrade. There's hampers in every room now. I hate my kids put their clothes on the floor. Well, there's no place to put them, so now we got hampers. I want to be able to dress my kids because my wife doesn't have to. And now I've got cool dressers and I know whose drawers are whose. Praise God. We upgraded the system because the needs of our home increased. And we were still operating on an old version. So we upgraded the version, and I'm telling you what I've not been so happy in my life. Come home, and just, hmm, upgraded home. That's what I keep thinking of myself. Praise God. So how do we apply this passage? I told enough jokes. Let me apply. Outfitter started with 14 members. Now we have 60. Outfitter's first gathering of regular attendance was 44. Now our regular attendance is right at 100. We used to only have one service on Wednesday nights. Now we have a Sunday morning, Wednesday night. We have a kids' ministry that we never once had. Now we have a student ministry that we never once had. And now listen, I, I keep hearing very kind words. We're afraid that you're going to wear yourself out. Well, listen, we planted a church in an unreached place and people are getting saved. We're going to get worn out, but we're going to try and do it healthy. Still keep us out. We still are trying to delegate things. I appreciate your concern for all of our souls. Uh, but just keep praying because we're actively working. We just took 12 people through our leadership training. We're excited about that. We're, we're, we're actively working to upgrade the system that manages Alphabet Church. We were doing so good, and then, then Lance abandoned us. <laughs> What I mean by that, you didn't know our associate pastor was called on God uh, to go to Texas and serve as an associate pastor in Texas. And we're celebrating that. I'm only making fun of him because he can't talk right now and I have a mic. And so, 
but we're actively working to upgrade how we run this church. And so I, I wanted to just say one, if you feel overlooked, you may have been. Okay? The church grew really quickly, 118% in the last two years. I was not prepared for that growth. Never thought that growth would be possible. And God grew us. So you may have been overlooked, okay? You really may have been. But here's what I want to say. Be gracious, please. And help with the solution. Getting your feelings hurt and leaving doesn't help anybody. It just means that we actually never realized there was a problem. And there might be someone else who did walk in the exact same shoes as you. So please, please, please. Be gracious and help with the solution. Okay, so the first thing we saw is the practical needs increase as numbers increase. Okay, let's look at the next. Look at verse 3. Verse 3. So here's the problem. We cannot give up preaching the word to wait on tables. And what's going on here is the word is deacon, diakonos, to deacon tables. Now, these, these people aren't given the title of deacon, and the apostles aren't given the title of pastor. For the sake of efficiency, I'm saying that it becomes those roles. The apostles' role becomes the pastor elder role that we see in 1 Timothy and Titus. The, the, the seven men chosen become the deacon role that we see outlined in 1 Timothy and Titus. And so, for efficiency's sake, I'm calling them those terms, but if you want to hear, they were not yet those terms in this passage. They, this is the template through which elders and deacons is, is based on partly. Okay? So the second thing is looking at verse 3. Brothers and sisters, here's the solution to the problem. Select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit of wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal came to the whole company, so they chose Stephen, and they listed out all the people that they chose. So the first thing that we see is that God's upgraded system, God's upgraded system requires spirit-filled elders, deacons, and members. God's updated system is, as they were growing, they may recognize a need, and they needed spirit-filled apostles, right? So we're going to call that pastor elder. Then we're going to see that there is a need for spirit-filled deacons, okay? And they don't get this title here, but it becomes the title throughout the years of the early church. And then the last thing is that there's a need for spirit-filled members. Okay? So, I, I love when you see a play on word here. You don't see it in English. I wouldn't have seen it unless a professor showed it to me. But the Greek word here is some plays on words. It says, we can not be with deacon the word of God. It would not be right for us to deacon tables. You get people to deacon tables. We will deacon the word of God. And so there's a, a, a great phrase from the group called Nine Marks that, that every person in the church is serving somehow. They're deaconing somehow. And so elders serve by leading and preaching. Deacons lead by serving, and members are always being equipped. Ephesians 4, uh, 11, it all says that, that Jesus gives to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers for the building and up of the believers to do the work of ministry. Church, you are the ministry. So the reason that God has an upgraded system of spirit-filled elders, deacons, and members is because this is the only way they can operate. The only way they can operate is if the pastors are shepherding in a spirit-filled way and, and ministering into the Word. This doesn't just mean Sunday morning. If you remember going back once the apostles got out of prison, it says that in the temple, in the, in the synagogue, where we actually just go back, every day in the temple and in various homes, they continue teaching and proclaiming the good news of Jesus as the Messiah. And so as a, as a pastor, the role of pastor elder is that we would be doing the ministry of the Word of God, which is a, a summarizing sentence of the transforming work of the gospel. That is largely the pastor's responsibility, okay, or, or priority. And then the deacons, they are the ones making sure that the practical needs are met so the spiritual health can exist. And then we last of all the members. <coughs> last of all, not least of all the members, must be spirit-filled. So you won't have an increasing church. 
You won't have healthy needs. You'll be putting up fires and then they can be started. And so at every level of, of leadership in the church, elders, deacons, and members, each one of them has an absolutely vital role and the common denominator of all that vitality is to be spirit-filled. It doesn't mean you're making you dance through the aisles and things of that sort. What this means is that you walk in the ways of Jesus. This, the scripture says that those who walk in the flesh are the things that are opposite of the scriptures. But those who walk in the spirit have life. And so to be spirit-filled means that you're living in obedience to Jesus Christ and you're living out those commands amongst others, amongst your church family, amongst the lost people around you. I love this phrase from Pastor Nathan Lino, uh, SBC pastor, prominent, great equipper of people. He says, the pastor's number one responsibility is to care for the flock. The pastor's number one priority is the prayer and the ministry of the word. And so you notice that these pastors aren't saying, oh, I'm going to sit and read books, so I'm going to have to, mm -hmm. yeah, don't know that we take care of every day. If they were that pastor, then their proposal to the one, they wouldn't have asked the church their opinion if they were a lazy pastor. Um, I, I hope, I think our church is saying what we do at members' meetings is absolutely exhausting work getting to that point. Uh, because the elders have worked really hard to try and communicate to the church in a healthy way so that your vote is informed and spirit filled because you have the authority to make big decisions in the life of our church as a member. If, we, if, if pastors were lazy, they wouldn't ask people what their opinion was because it's easier to not get people on board. And so, anyway, uh, the pastor's number one responsibility is to care for the flock. The pastor's number one priority is the ministry and, the, and their prayer and the ministry of the word. And so, this problem is going to disrupt a couple things. It's going to disrupt the health of the church and it's going to disrupt the ministry of the word and prayer. And so what we see is that God's operating system requires these different leaders, right? Spirit-filled, elders, deacons, members. So here's one really cool way that we can apply this. Is that a problem is an opportunity to be revealed. This is something that I have a hard time. I don't know, I don't know how you guys handle conflict, but when problems arise, my favorite way is to make it easy. Whether that's when you're ignoring it, or whether that's when you're just smoking it with something bigger than that problem itself. The hardest part is what? Is to engage like Jesus did with that conflict. And so you know what? This conflict is actually an opportunity for deeper unity. And so hey, what was going on again? Okay, well let's, let's solve this problem together. Again, so as, as our church grows and problems are going to come up, here's what I want to be a big house for this problem where you're like, you can't. Okay. So don't be like, well, you know what? That was introduced. So, right? That's probably going to elicit in me not the godliest response, okay? I am not Jesus, though I try to shepherd like him. And so, so this isn't even any of our elders. And so this problem was an opportunity for deeper unity, but you only get to deeper unity if you work through being filled in the Spirit to work towards a solution together. And so what I love about this is it's, you've got the whole company. He says they got in the whole church, which is where we see the precedent for what we call members meetings. We got in the whole church six times a year, every month, and we present the problems of the world, we celebrate the testimonies, and we make decisions together, we eat those meals together. You should join them and be a member of our church. These members meetings are accelerated, I promise. And so these members meetings are times for us to come together the whole company heard this proposal and they liked it. And then the whole company selected seven men to fix the problem. What's really unique about the problem is that the Greek women were being overlooked. Did you notice those were seven Greek names? I didn't because I don't know the Greek name from Hebrew name. I thought some of them sounded a little Hebrew. I don't know the answer. I didn't know that was Greek. But this is seven Greek speaking, or seven Greek names. And so the church in there was the being filled with the Spirit. Selected, they knew there was one group that was being disadvantaged. So to protect that, they actually put in people uh, who would have a little bit more compassion towards that, those folks, because that's where they come from. 
So, <coughs> that's we saw the practical needs increase as numbers increase. God's upgrading system requires spiritual elders and deacons and members. The last thing that we want to look at is verse 7. We come to the, to the bottom line of this sandwich. In order to work, if you will, in verse 7. It says, So the word of God spread. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number. And a large group of priests became a radiant Healthy churches and systems allow God's transforming work to go in Healthy churches and systems allow God's transforming work to go on <clears throat> I had a conversation with one of our members the other day. It was so full of love and grace, not been encouraged ever since. But one of the things was, is, is what are we going to do to mitigate the growth? We're not mitigate, we're going to what are we going to do to accommodate the growth? And I, I kind of was like, what well, we're trying. The problem is, is it takes, you got to raise up leaders. And you don't just form those quickly. It takes time. And then my wife shared a, a very funny story a part of the problem with this and one thing that slows down leadership development. And I'm not exactly sure my motive in telling you this, but take it for however the spirit lets it hit you. We have so many stories of our friends who planted churches and they trust the people and brought them into leadership and then those people killed the church. And so, uh, I just want to say that when you bring this idea of delegating, if any of you have said leadership, you know delegating means significantly more work for you for a season. Then you can offload it. And so, uh, again, I know uh, I can't discern all of our hearts reasons, but some of it is that it's not when, when people say to our elders, maybe that's what it is, but I don't want to defend our elders, just to leave it, okay? Just delegate. Just delegate means a minimum of three months of work. If any of you ever delegated anything, I think you understand. But then not only is that, then you're going to have the people to delegate to. And then those people have to not move. Which is, which is the, the, the curse of Wyoming is we get people for three years. So a year to get to know a year to get to know them, they break their hearts, right? And I'm not only talking about the game. This, is, this, has a, this has been a, 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 a cycle from the plan of this church. That's life. That's okay. But I'm just thinking that you want to defend our elders just like 3% of 100% of the people who are change. It's worth working really, really, really hard to do this. But you have to have God and trustworthy people. They have to stay long enough to make it through the process. Then they have to be willing to serve. So it's not as easy as just delegating. Alright, I'm done defending. No one's actually attacked us. Perhaps that's just my perceived thoughts at times. But what we see here is that this problem in the church had the potential to derail the kingdom growth. Acts chapter, Acts chapter 1, the Spirit is promised. Acts chapter 2, the Spirit comes and thousands are saved. Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, where we're still living in that. Acts chapter 4, persecution. I'm looking at my notes. I'm trying to not use my thing. Notes and I messed up like six times. Persecution came in chapter three from the outside. Then persecution came, or problems came from the inside with Ananias and Sapphira lying to the church. Then persecution came from the outside, from the high priest rising up and arresting all of the apostles. And now we become Acts chapter six. A complaint arose. The last time that something arose, it was the entire group of the Sanhedrin trying to kill the apostles. And now and then again, it's just, it's just problem after problem after problem after problem. And then you're reading this like, like I was. And you say, goodness gracious, are they going to make it through this one? They keep coming down on the feet, but are they going to come out through this one? And the answer is resounding yes. When you stay filled in the Spirit, when you stay when you work through the problems together, what we see is, is this inclusive increased growth. What we see is the way they were able to increase in number before the problems and increase in number post-problem is because they were filled with the Spirit. They had godly pastors, godly deacons, godly 
that we're going 85 miles an hour down the interstate and we're replacing tires at the same time. Okay? The last thing we need to be doing.
Reminded of Peter's sermon in chapter 5. They were told that they were going to be jailed, beaten, possibly killed if they continue preaching the name of Jesus. And Peter says, We must obey God, God, and people. The God of our ancestors raised us up, or raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and savior to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. See, the Spirit of God, which is the common man of all His power, and all His unity, and all His salvation, and all His growth, and all His leader development, the common man is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is only given to those who obey Him. And so if you want your life to be used by God, well then there's a big problem. It won't be until you have the Spirit of God in you. And the only way you get the Spirit of God in you is through obedience. The beginning of obedience is recognizing that you've been disobedient. You think about the Garden of Eden. Start out beautiful, man it went down on earth. Everything was good. There was unity. And then sin disrupted all of that. And then you get a whole bunch of kings. As a, as a pastor, I was uh, reading his devotional this week. This pastor says, the whole book of kings, all the leaders of Israel, just show you, surely, surely there was a man king. They can actually do what God wants. Even the good kings got the ball. And so then God sends the prophets to answer that question. And do it perfectly. And that key was fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah. That's what he spent his entire ministry doing. He's saying, I am he that the prophets spoke of. I am the king. I am the promised one. I am the one who will fulfill all of God's will on your behalf. I will be the one. And so Jesus lived a sinless life. And he was crucified. And all that crucifixion, what he did, is not only was he the king of kings, the will of God, he also became the king of your disobedience and mine. And upon that cross, Christ said, it is finished, meaning that your disobedience can now be paid for, can now be paid for. It's not applied to your account at your death. It's not a death benefit. You can live like a sinner all your life. And then it's a death benefit. They're like, yeah, I want to check that box. So Jesus paid for my sins. Now I'm going to go to heaven. Sure. It is finished. The debt payment for your sin can be applied. But obedience is the entry way. So what we see taking place in the book of Acts is Jesus dies. He resurrects the disciples are like that's what we've been talking about this whole time. Let's go and tell everyone what we've seen. Thank you again about St. Moses. Jesus gave an illustration on how to build your life. He says the man who builds his life on himself, it's like building his house on sand. Builds a beautiful home when the wind came. And the rain fell. The house fell and the rain was the fall. It says, he who built his life on me. It's like a house built on a firm foundation. The wind comes, the rain falls, but it cannot be shaken. The invitation of God to you today is, will you come and follow me? Will you be forgiven of your will you admit your sin? And then be forgiven of it. And then will you follow Jesus? And live the truth of his life. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if while I preach, maybe that spoke to you. Maybe there's something, uh, as the scripture says, burning in your heart taking place. Maybe as the scripture says, the eyes of your heart have been opened. Maybe now you see something you've never seen before about your life. And what you see is that 
you are in need of forgiveness. In need of the turn and follow Jesus. If that's you, I'm going to lead out in a prayer to be special about it, just simply confessing the truth of what I just shared with you, the gospel. If that's you, and that's God, I suppose you pray this prayer to yourself with me. And in doing so, surrender and commit to following Jesus. God, I need you to forgive me. I've built my life on the sand. I've sinned against you and disobeyed you. But I believe Jesus died in my place. I believe Jesus conquered death. And it's calling me to follow him. Today, God, I'm going to build my life on Help me to be obedient to you. Help me to be faithful to you. Help me to tell others about you. Forgive me, God. Give me your Holy Spirit. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you pray that our pastors are going to be in the back and during this next song, we'd love for you to come talk to us. But what we ask is whether you can talk to us or not, fill out a connect card, let us know that you surrendered your life to Jesus today and drop it in the red box on your way out. Let me pray for our church and then we'll sing. Father, we love you, we're grateful for you. Lord, thank you for this church. Outfitter Church truly is a blessing to everyone who is a part of it. We are so grateful for what you've done here. Help us to continue. In Jesus' name, amen.